WCCO and Twin City Federal present Minnesota Milestone. Frontiers of Enterprise. The story of business, labor, and finance. It's a long, hard road from general store to industrial giant. It takes money and know-how and enterprise and the willingness to gamble. It takes hard work, whether the rise is to corporation president or head of the labor union. And full stature does not come in one lifetime. It has taken many lifetimes to build the great financial houses, the great mills, and manufacturing industries. I'm E.W. Zebarth. I am Cedric Adams. And I am Bob DeHaven. Our is to tell you how it all happened. From whence came the huge factories and tall buildings in the great cities, and the bustling smaller centers of business in the towns. This is a story of building and growth and reaching out. Another in the series of Minnesota Milestones. Minnesota's Frontiers of Enterprise. Yep, this is Minnesota, all right. Not much doubt about that. We've got 84,000 square miles in our borders. That makes us 11th in size among the 48. Our estimated population is about 3,300,000. And I guess we'll make it 3.5 million by the 1960 census, all right. About two-thirds of us live in cities and towns, and the other third on farms. Total labor force, 1,200,000, maybe a little more. Average weekly earnings, $81 a week. And we get along pretty well here in the North Star State. Oh, we've had our share of squabbles over the years. You know how it is in most families. Once in a while, we get a little bit too big for our britches. And first thing you know, somebody with better sense comes along to wear them. But like I said, we get along all right most of the time. And we go about our business from day to day, grabbing our opportunities where we see them. I suppose most of us live about average lives. And an average life on any average morning in this workaday world starts about like this. Oh, I guess I gotta be going. Uh, hand me my lunch, will you? Here you are. Thanks. Bye, dear. I'll see you tonight. Bye, Tom. Now, take good care of yourself, and don't drive too fast. Oh, no. I'll... Oh, Tom. Tom, wait a minute. Yeah? Say, I wonder, could I have the car tomorrow? Oh, I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I guess so. We'll talk about it tonight, huh? Yes, but I promised Marge I'd take the kid shop. I got to punch a time clock in 20 minutes. We'll talk about it tonight, huh? Bye. Bye. <laughs> Just like that. See how it is? I guess the thing you notice about us most here in 1958 is hurry. That's the word, hurry. Hurry to get there, hurry to get back. Hurry off to work, hurry home. Hurry to have a little fun. Makes no difference whether it's Tom there on his way to get his time clock punched or the big boss himself. Everybody hurries. Only I guess the politer way of saying it is hustle, drive, energy, get up and go. Now I'm telling you this because it's a part of our story too, part of the story of our state, of Minnesota, of us, and how we came to be this way. So here we go, back. Way back, back to the days when there were no cities or farms. It was the fur trader who was the first businessman on the new land of Minnesota. The voyageurs or canoe men brought in the goods for trade with the Indians, and the voyageurs paddled the baled furs eastward, across Lake Superior or down the Mississippi River. But it was the fur trader who manned the trading post the year round, the biggest post of them all at Grand Portage in the far northeastern corner of Minnesota. He manned the smaller posts, more than 100 of them, that dotted the shores of the lakes and the banks of rivers. And here at the trading posts, Minnesota's first business was transacted. 
The trader and his clerk operated a store. The rules were simple. So many furs equal so much salt pork, so much flour, and so much whiskey. And Henry Sibley, himself a fur trader, wrote how it was done, how another trader, Louis Provacal, kept his accounts. He kept his Indian credit books by hieroglyphics, having a peculiar figure for each article of merchandise understood only by himself. And in marking down the peltries received from the Indians, he drew the form of the animal, the skin of which was to be represented. He also had a mode of indicating the names of his Indian debtors on his account books, a method peculiar to himself. And some of the most famous men in Minnesota's early history were traders. There was Jean-Baptiste Faribault and his son Alexander. William Aiken, William and Alan Morrison. Henry Sibley was the trader at Mendota. Martin McLeod at Lackey Parle and at Big Stone Lake. Dr. Charles W. Borup, later one of St. Paul's first bankers. And Joseph R. Brown, an inventor of a steam-driven wagon long before the days of the automobile. And after the Treaty of 1837 drove the Indians to the west side of the Mississippi River and the settlers came, the trading post was a ready-made general store. Mr. Sibley, has my calico come yet? And please don't tell me it's not here. I ordered it way last September. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, Mrs. Grady. The ice was slow in going out of the river. But the steamboat will be coming up from St. Louis in about two weeks, I hear. I received this draft from the east, Mr. Sibley. Uh, I wonder, would you be so kind as to cash it, please? Well, certainly, Mrs. Grady. Yes, the trading post back in those days, before Minnesota became a state, even performed the elementary banking functions cashing drafts, and making small loans. It was the trader who laid the foundations for Minnesota's business and financial future. Wholesaler, merchant, banker, all in one. There, you see? It took a lot of hustle in those days. Now let's see. I I've got to check up a minute. Oh, yes, here it is. Where we once had a little more than 100 trading posts, in 1958, we were able to boast 36,000 retail businesses in Minnesota. Lump them all together, and they're doing about $4 billion in sales. And in case you're interested, our entire country wasn't worth much more than that back in 1850. Wholesale trade, $5 billion every single year, regular as the clock. Our 680 banks and 76 savings and loan associations with assets over four billion. Of course, most of that's our money, yours and mine. Well, I hope you'll excuse me. Just wanted you to have some of those facts in mind as we get along with our story. Wherever the paths of men crossed, that's where the cities and the towns grew. And optimism was everywhere. Yeah, now just look at that. Just look at it. And see, uh, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve teams tied up along Main Street. And there's seven of them and right now, either going in or out of town. And three steamboats down at the landing. I tell you, John, we're growing. We're going to have a thousand people in this town someday. Oh, it's funny you counting teams that way. I've been doing it for two months every day. You know what I think? I think this town needs a bank. We're big enough now. I decided it last night. I'm going to clean out that corner of the store up by the front window, and I'm going to start a bank. And that's the way it was. The merchant, the lawyer, the hotel keeper frequently just decided to set up shop as the town's banker, too. And money, actual cash, was a mighty short commodity. It always was in a frontier community. The frontier always owed, was always in debt, to the big city back east. Many early banks issued their own currency, which led to this confusing situation. Mr. Payne. Uh, yes, Harry? There's a gentleman out here with $100 in currency from the Cadwalder Johnson Bank. Uh, what should we allow him? Yeah, just a minute here. Yeah, let me see my list. Hmm. Cadwaller Johnson, discount 19%. Tell him we'll allow him $80. Yes, Mr. Payne. By 1854, there was not one but three banks in St. Paul. Minneapolis had one bank founded that same year. Soon there were more than a dozen banks in the Twin Cities, and from that time forward, St. Paul and Minneapolis gradually came to dominate more and more the state's banking functions. Many of the early banks in Minnesota were forced to close in the Panic of 1857. 
In fact, throughout the 1800s, the banking story is one of constant change. New banks starting, some failing, continual merger and realignment. And then, the big depression of the 1890s. From 1893 until 1899, the story was the same, not only in Minnesota, but the nation over. All but the strongest banks failed, and many a businessman faced ruin. Great fortunes were lost, and equally tragic, small savings were lost, too. Olaf, is that you? Yeah, it's me. Oh, I'm so glad you're home. I can hardly wait to tell you what little Hilda said. Why, Olaf, what's the matter? You look so pale. What's wrong? Don't you feel well? I feel sick, Hilda, but, but not the way you mean. But why, Olaf? What's wrong? Well, Hilda, the bank closed this afternoon. Closed? What do you mean, closed? I, I, I mean closed, shut down, locked up. Oh, Olaf, what will we do? I don't know, our savings, the money we were saving toward our own house. Well, well, now, now don't you worry, Olaf. We'll make out somehow. You're still working, you know, and, and what's more important to me, you're all right. Yes, it was tragic back there in the 1890s. So many little savings gone, so many dreams shattered. But out of that experience came a milestone in finance. It was the end of an era, the end of the part-time banker, the end of the corner-in-the-shop bank, the merchant banker, and the lawyer banker. From that time forward, the professional banker, the full-time banker, assumed control of the business. And out of the time of trouble came new financial stability as Minnesota moved forward on into the period of its greatest industrial growth, which we'll hear about in Act Two. to look back to mine the mountain of historical experience for the rich veins of wisdom running through it like threads of gold. And then when we refine our sample, one of the truths which shines forth is that success is compounded of hard work, self-confidence, and thrift. Thrift helps us have self-confidence. Thrift enables us to put ideas into action. Thrift, too, is the handy handle with which we get hold of opportunity and hang on to it on the way up. Thrift indeed works for us in so many ways that everybody, I'm sure, needs a savings account. Twin City Federal has offered safe, profitable saving facilities to people in our area for more than a third of a century. Twin City Federal would enjoy serving you. Accounts at Twin City Federal are insured for safety by the Federal Savings and Loan Insurance Corporation a permanent agency of the United States government. Dividends are paid quarterly, every three months, and the current rate is 3.5%, the top rate in town on insured savings. For more progress, start saving. Stop in soon at the quarter billion dollar savings institution, Twin City Federal, where the twin clock flashes the time and the temperature in downtown St. Paul and Minneapolis, and where you'll find plenty of free parking for you right at the door. And now let's return to our Minnesota Milestone story. It wasn't more than about 50 years ago that farming was what most folks did for a living around these parts, but things have certainly changed and most of it in my lifetime, too. Why, I can remember when the Sanderson place was out the edge of town. It's a big factory there now, dried milk plant. Big machinery standing right in the same spot where Ole Sanderson's chickens used to peck in the gravel driveway that led to the barnyard. Why, 30 years ago, if you told Ole that's what would happen to his place, he'd have died laughing. Got to look at my list here again. Yeah. Um, uh, we got about 5,500 manufacturing plants here in our state in 1958. More than 200,000 people working them. And they pulled down quite a chunk of money every year. Nearly one billion dollars, all of them. Together, that is. The book says right here that about one and one half percent of the stuff that's manufactured in our whole country of ours is made right here in Minnesota. Now some folks feel rather bad about that, think it ain't enough. 
Our share should be bigger than that 1.5%, and they're working mighty hard to do something about it. I wouldn't argue with them. Every year we got more mouths to feed. As these kids grow up, they got to work someplace. Now take Tom, for instance. He made it. He's punching that time clock oh, yeah, right sure. now. <laughs> Say, Tom! Oh, hello, Joe. Watch out. Say, Tom, the uh, superintendent wants to see you. Who, me? Yep, you. What for? Go out back and pitch pennies, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Why don't you ask him? Okay. Good morning, Mr. Albright. Did you want to see me? Uh, yes, I did, Tom. Shut the door, will you? Now, uh... How's the night school course coming? Oh, fine, fine. I'm still at it. Mm-hmm. Say, Tom, I'd like to have you work over at the motor assembly for the next couple of weeks. I, uh, I'd like to see how you work out. That, that's great. When do you want me to start? Right now. Yeah, report to Harold and tell him I sent you, okay? All right. Oh, and Tom... Yes, sir? Uh, uh, don't get discouraged now. About night school, I mean. Oh, yes. Okay, Mr. Albright, I won't. And thanks. Yep, that's the way it is in this day and age. You gotta hustle. Matter of fact, that's the way industry did start in our state. Somebody had an idea, took a chance. And well, he just started, that's all. Here we go, back to the 1850s. Industry? There was no industry. Just the Mississippi rolling past St. Paul. Men stood on the riverbank and watched the water gush in torrents of foam, eddy and whirl and roar at the falls of St. Anthony. They stood and dreamed. Here was power, plenty of power. At first, power to saw the logs coming down river from the north, power to operate the little grist mills, and then power for grinding wheat into flour. Soldiers from Fort Snelling made that discovery way back in the 1820s and set up the first crude flour mill. But the first successful venture, the Island Mill, built in 1854 by John Eastman and later sold to John S. Pillsbury, became the nucleus of the present Pillsbury Company. And in 1855, a young New Englander, Cadwaller Washburn, founded the Minneapolis Mill Company, forerunner of the present General Mills Company. And then came the start of Minneapolis' 10-year battle to save St. Anthony Falls. It started when W.W. W. Eastman headed a company formed to carry out a brilliant plan. The idea? Dig a tunnel through the sandstone rock from Hennepin Island below the falls, under Nicollet Island to the quiet mill pond above, and develop more industry in Nicollet and Hennepin Islands. The tunnel, six feet high and six feet wide, was under construction. And then on October 5th, 1869... Look out! Get out of here! Run for your life! Run! This tunnel's going to leak! Get out of here! The tunnel is caving! And 100 workmen did run. They barely escaped with their lives. The surging water from the river had eaten its way through the soft limestone. Above Nicollet Island, there appeared a huge swirling vortex, a maelstrom. The next day, the break increased. A mighty flood of water shot through the tunnel with such force that it car carved huge chunks out of Hennepin Island. Great rocks broke off, were carried like wood chips into the raging torrent. The fire department came, 1,000 mill hens were brought to the sea. Men recognized the danger at once. The raging torrent of waters would cut through the upper layer of hard limestone, the river wearing quickly through the soft sandstone, and destroy St. Anthony Falls destroy the source of power, and destroy the cities of St. Anthony and Minneapolis. You men there! You! Take that team and wagon! Cut those timbers! Yes! It was a general alarm. Up All those the brothers. residents of Take Minneapolis them. and St. Anthony turned out to help. Citizens from St. Paul joined in the battle to save the fall. But all in vain, the swirling, angry river, raging in bull-like fury, swallowed timbers, rock boulders, loads of earth, and spawed them out through the tunnel below. A huge log raft was constructed and then piled high with rock and earth to be sunk over the whirling funnel like a plug in a giant bathtub. The raft settled slowly over the swirling water there at the upper end of Nicollet Island. Hey, what do you say? Look at that! Look at her! She's oh, working! That'll stop her! We right. won! We won! <laughs> Oh, 
Old Man River had won another battle. A huge piece of Nicollet Island had been away. And the raft, piled high with dirt and boulders, twisted, spun, and sank, smashed to bits in the hole. The next day, a thousand men returned and work was started on a coffer dam above the mighty leak in the Mississippi. But it took years, many years, to repair that damage. It wasn't until 1876 that at last the work of saving St. Anthony Falls was finished. The gaping tunnel, now 20 feet wide, at last filled. A concrete support laid under the weakened falls to support the last thin layer of limestone. And the cost? Nearly $900,000 to save the falls of St. Anthony. And then came the roller method of grinding wheat. The air of the mills was filled with fine flour dust. Millers knew it, tried to collect the dust to prevent a waste of flour. But there was another danger. On the 2nd of May, 1878, And the great roof of the Washburn A Mill, the largest in Minneapolis, rose to a height of 500 feet. It poised for an instant in midair, and then fell with a crash into the crater of seething flames where the mill had stood. The area was covered with the remains of three great structures blown to atoms. And the dust raised by explosion exploded again and again and again. And the big explosion at the Washburn A Mill was followed by fire and explosions in five other mills. 18 lives, three quarters of a million dollars in property. Nearly half the milling capacity of Minneapolis were lost. The calamity attracted nationwide attention. Millers turned their entire energies to the problem, soon learned that fine flour dust was as explosive as gunpowder. They developed dust collecting devices, which are still in use at the mills. Minneapolis mills took the lead in adopting new scientific methods. The industry had a stake in pushing the railroads westward to the wheat fields of the great rolling prairies and eastward to the big consuming markets. In the 70s, millers organized a system of grain marketing through the Minneapolis Chamber of Commerce. Since 1946, that marketing has been centered in the Minneapolis Grain Exchange. The Minneapolis millers reached the peak of their output back in 1916, more than 29 million barrels. Their advertising slogans became household words. Eventually, why not now, asked Gold Medal. And came the answer from its competitor, because Pillsbury's best. Minneapolis, headquarters for the giants of the milling industry, General Mills, Pillsbury, and International Milling. Minneapolis, still one of the nation's most important milling centers. Listening to Frontiers of Enterprise on Minnesota Milestones, coming to you from your centennial station in Minneapolis and St. Paul, WCCO. If someone offered to sell you security, greater personal and family independence, more freedom from worry, do you think you'd buy? Oh, I forgot to mention the price, too. Well, it costs just a small amount each payday. You can decide how much. And what's more, your money is conveniently available for other things when you need it. Now, I can be talking about just one thing, a savings account. For only in a savings account do you get such tremendous value for the money invested. And have your money practically at your fingertips, too. Such a fine idea naturally leads us to a fine place to save. Twin City Federal, the quarter billion dollar savings institution, where more than 100,000 persons from the Northwest are building safe, growing savings accounts. Safe because accounts are insured for safety by a permanent agency of the United States government. Growing with the help of regular dividends, the current rate, three and a half percent. Why not join the thrifty thousands who save with strict safety, generous return at Twin City Federal? Stop in where the twin clock flashes the time and the temperature and where there's plenty of free parking for you right at Twin City Federal's door. And now let's listen again to the reminiscences of our Minnesota old timer. Well, 
by now you should be getting the idea. Those pioneer ancestors of ours really had some tough problems facing them, didn't they? But that's the way it is. Just one problem at a time, I always say. Solve that, go along to the next one, and so on through life. That's what our boy Tom is doing right now. It's turning out to be quite a day in his young life. Say, you're Mr. Harold Olson, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. Well, I'm Tom Reynolds. Oh, yes, you're the chap Mr. Albright mentioned. Well, glad to meet you. As I understand it, you um, you don't have your engineering degree yet, do you? No, I don't. Yeah, but... but you're going to night school now. Huh? Yes, that's right. And I figure I should be finished in six, maybe eight months. Well, that's fine, fine. Of course, you realize this is a little irregular. We usually hire only graduate engineers in this department. But because of your record, we decided to give you a chance. Now, we don't have time to run a school here, you see. We have a production schedule. You'll have to carry your share of the load, sink or swim. Yes, that's what Mr. Albright said when I asked for the transfer. Okay, just as long as that's understood. Now, here's what I want you to do. Hmm, I've been in that spot before, haven't you? Haven't you ever walked into something like that and said to yourself, here's one time, Mr. Smarty Pants, you bit off more than you could chew. Then come the butterflies in the stomach, but it's too late. You've got no choice. You've got to fight it through. Over the years, a lot of us in Minnesota have felt just like that. Plenty of examples, too. So let's get back to our story and see what some of us have done about these butterflies in the stomach. We're at Two Harbors, Minnesota. The year 192 and a warm day in July. The seagulls float on silent wings, flutter, then float again, sailing over the blue white-capped water, back over the white sandy shore with its spikes of green grass. The gray-white birds with wings outspread, sailing, dipping, floating. The train with its string of rusty red ore cars chuffs to the switch, grinds to a halt. Silently, an ore carrier waits by a blackened, steel-girdered dock. And in town, in the upstairs office of lawyer John Dwan, five men gather. It's serious business. The formation of a new corporation. The first stock of Minnesota mining and manufacturing was offered to the public at one dollar a share. The story is that one purchaser in Duluth bought 1,700 shares of 3M stock and later traded it for a new Buick car. Had he kept the stock, it would now be worth more than $8 million. It was in the spring of 1907 that a tall, red-haired South Dakota farm boy attending business college in Duluth was told to report to the sandpaper plant on the waterfront. William L. McKnight climbed the rickety stairs to the second floor office and faced the stern-visaged head bookkeeper. Are, um, are you Mr. Spooner, sir? Yes. Well, um, I'm uh, William McKnight. I, um, well, that is, um, they sent me over from the Duluth Business College. You wanted an assistant bookkeeper. Let's see your handwriting. My handwriting? Yes, your handwriting. Here, sit down. Now, write on this ledger sheet. Yes, sir. There you are, sir. Is that your best? Yes, sir. I, I mean, uh, uh, no, sir. I, <clears throat> I guess I'm a little nervous. Nervous. Uh, what are you nervous about? Well, we'll try you anyway. Oh, gee. Gee, thank you, sir. Uh, report on Monday. Shut the door on your way out. On Monday, May 13th, 1907, William McKnight did report for work at the 3M Company, which had been moved from Two Harbors to Duluth. His salary, $11.50 a week. He did not realize it then, but it was to be a lifetime association. Minnesota Mining became an international corporation in the 1930s. It grew and expanded all through the Great Depression at a time when many other businesses were in serious decline. Under the guidance of William L. McKnight, now chairman of the board, the 3M Company has achieved outstanding success a world leader in its field. 
Another success story began with a young inventor named Al Butts of Minneapolis. He grew tired of trudging up and down stairs to adjust the damper of his coal-fired furnace, so he built a device called a damper flapper to adjust the indoor temperature automatically. A group of Minneapolis business pioneers organized the forerunner of the present Minneapolis Honeywell Regulator Company. And their story closely parallels that of 3M. At first, a tiny firm which, under the guiding genius of W.R. Sweat, became one of the nation's greatest names in electronics. Yes, there was success, but there was also failure. Nineteen twenty-nine, and the scene is downtown Minneapolis. The occasion, a three-day ceremony marking the opening of Wilbur Fauché's huge monument to himself. The pale gray stone building with the huge words Fauché carved in its sides was from that day forth a landmark, an important part of the Minneapolis skyline. The band was John Philip Sousa's and the famed bandmaster's reported fee was $20,000. Wilbur Fauché. Here was a man with utility companies in 12 states and five foreign countries, banks in both Minneapolis and St. Paul. In 30 states, Fauché owned drug stores, hotels, steamship lines, bus lines, cold storage plants, textile and shoe companies, factories. And over Fauché's desk hung a motto, why worry? It won't last. Nothing does. And it didn't last. Just days after the ceremony inaugurating his Fauché Tower came the stock market crash of 1929. The Fauché Enterprises went into receivership on November 1st of that year. A $25 million paper empire came toppling down that day. On September 1st, 1957, the 28th anniversary of the dedication of his Fauché Tower, Wilbur Fauché died at a convalescent home on the north side of Minneapolis. His body lay in the Hennepin County morgue, unrecognized for some hours, labeled simply Wilbur Fauché. In the 1920s, few men foresaw the shadow of the Great Depression. Nevertheless, action taken in that day gave the area financial stability, the means of weathering the Great Depression it might not otherwise have developed. It came in 1928. Officers of the Northwestern National Bank of Minneapolis conceived the idea of organizing a group of banks throughout the entire state, indeed the entire area. On January 8, 1929, came the public announcement. A new company, known as Northwest Bank Corporation, had entered the banking field and had arranged to acquire the Northwestern National Bank. The race was on. In that same year, the first organized the first bank stock corporation. Both groups began acquiring banks in the Twin Cities and banks throughout Minnesota and adjoining states. The movement resulted in the formation of two huge banking groups, each a closely knit financial organization. These two groups, Northwest Bank Corporation and First Bank Stock Corporation remain to this day financial pillars of Minnesota. Both groups weathered the bank holiday of March 6, 1933. The Banking Act of 1933 made deposit insurance a reality. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation greatly strengthened the confidence of depositors in banks, making banking institutions solid, secure, and strong. Adding to the financial stability of Minnesota, the Congress established the federal savings and loan system in 1932. That was followed quickly by the federal home loan bank system and the Federal Savings and Loan Insurance Corporation. Since those acts, savings and loan associations have grown at a tremendous rate. Their purpose, as chartered by the government of the United States, to promote thrift and debt-free home ownership. Savings and loan associations provide one half the mortgage credit in Minnesota. In 1941, 
Savings and loan associations in Minnesota had total assets of less than $100,000. In 1958, their assets totaled more than $1 billion. And Minnesota faces the future, assured of financial stability undreamed of in the days of the pioneers. In just a moment, we'll hear about our third great resource, labor, which together with industry and finance is building Minnesota's future. a savings account if you've been too busy with other things that have interfered with starting one I hope you'll forgive me for reminding you of something you already know at Twin City Federal the current dividend rate is three and a half percent compounded quarterly the top rate in town on insured savings top safety top rate pretty compelling reasons and there are many more you'll enjoy one of them the minute you drive up there's plenty of free parking right at Twin City Federal's door and of course you can save by mail if you like. There are lots of teller's windows for quick service. So tomorrow or sometime very, stu very soon, start enjoying the pleasures, the progress, the peace of mind of a growing savings account at safe, convenient Twin City Federal, where the twin clock flashes the time and the temperature in downtown Minneapolis and St. Paul. Right now, we're going to tell you something about the labor history of Minnesota. You should be beginning to see how it is in our state. When you see what fo some folks did with so little, it makes you a little ashamed of your own efforts, doesn't it? But then we can't all be stemwinders, can't all be chiefs, as the saying goes. Now we got 230,000 people working in wholesale and retail trade lines, store folks, I guess you'd call them. About the same number work in our factories. On an average day, you'll find about 900,000 of us hard at work in offices, factories, and stores, not counting those out on the farms. Like I said earlier, we get along real well in this state. More than three-fourths of our workers belong to unions, and that's quite high. We've got nearly 2% of the total national workforce right here in Minnesota. You'd think we'd have 2% of the strikes, but we don't. Only one half of 1% of our workers are involved in strikes in any average year, and that's good. That's a mighty good record. What family squabbles we've had happened in the past. Yep, we got a little sore and threw things and called each other some hard names, but looking back, both sides to the quarrel look at it differently now than they did then. Nobody ever thought much about trade unions in Minnesota back there in the early days. There wasn't any need. I've taken all I'm going to take from you, George. My wife and I talked it over last night. We're packing up and heading west. Going to get some land and settle on our own place. I'm quitting right now. Well, that was all right as long as there was free public land out west. But in the 70s and 80s, as the land became more and more settled, things began to change. It wasn't so easy to walk out anymore. Trade unionism had appeared very early in some highly skilled crafts. Take the printers, for example. The first known labor organization in Minnesota was formed in 1858 by topographers in St. Paul. Another was organized in Minneapolis the next year. The printers, the painters, the plumbers, cigar makers, and then the trainmen. The railroad men organized during the 60s and 70s. The Knights of Labor appeared on a Minnesota scene for about a dozen years in the 70s and early 80s. A sort of labor cooperative. Something like the cooperatives the farmers were organizing out in the country at the time. Though the Knights of Labor was a short-lived organization, it did make some lasting contributions. It was responsible for our Labor Day holiday. The first Labor Day in Minnesota was observed on September 7th, 1885. The Knights of Labor were responsible for the Minnesota State Board of Labor Statistics, authorized by the legislature in 1887. The Knights of Labor gave way to the Minnesota State Federation of Labor, founded in the summer of 1890. To organized labor goes the credit for sponsoring and pushing many reforms 
which we consider commonplace today. Safe working conditions in shops and factories, child labor laws, an eight-hour day for public employees, women's suffrage, initiative and referendum in politics, home rule for cities, recall of public officials, and the election of United States senators by direct vote. Attempts to organize a party of working men and farmers were made by Ignatius Donnelly back in the 70s. In the 80s, an effort was made to unite the Farmers' Alliance and labor. In the 1890s, the workers and farmers did unite briefly in the populist revolt. But it wasn't until the 1900s that labor and the farmer joined forces in the nonpartisan league. And finally came the Farmer Labor Party, which was swept into office in the election of 1930. It was the early days of the Great Depression of the 30s. The Great Depression, only those who lived through it remember how terrible, how soul-shattering, how humbling it was. Please, mister, please. Just any kind of a job, anything. I'll, I'll sweep the floor, anything. I'm sorry I don't have any work. But look, I, I am desperate. I have a wife and baby at home. What'll I do? The baby needs look, milk. I... Look, it's tough. I know it's tough. But... I can't give you a job because I couldn't afford to pay you. Sure, I'm running a store, but I haven't got any money. You understand, not a dime. How can I give you a job? Tomorrow I may not even have a business. The Great Depression. No jobs. Businesses failed by the thousands all across the land. The relief agencies were swamped. The bread lines long. Men discouraged hit the road, wandering the nation in search of work. And there was no work, not enough to go around anyway. And in the summers, the sun beat down from a searing sky, burned the crops even as the young shoots poked upward. And the yellow clouds of dust swirled in from the dry west. It was on the 4th of March, 1933, that President Franklin Delano Roosevelt took office. He proceeded to enact reforms for the nation that he had passed as governor of New York. Among them, the National Industrial Recovery Act, which contained the almost unnoticed Provision 7A. Provision 7A gave labor the right to bargain collectively. Labor union leaders saw it and interpreted it as a call to action. They marched into employers, laid down their ultimatums. And strikes and violence broke across the face of our land and here in Minnesota. Unions striking for what they felt was a new freedom. Employers, businessmen, who had never dealt with unions before in their lives, resisting, fighting a form which they felt threatened their very existence. The General Drivers Union strike of May 1934 broke upon the Minneapolis scene with a fury that stunned and shocked the entire citizen. Hey, you guys! There's one of us! Yes. Yes. And that was the scene of the market area just north of the Minneapolis downtown section. The two forces arrayed on opposite sides, the general driver seeking the resisting employers and the citizens alliance. And into this tense situation stepped the farmer labor governor of Minnesota, the poised mediator, Floyd B. Olson. He spoke to the employers committee and to the union leaders, Miles, Vince, and Grant Dunn, Farrell Dobbs. He shuttled tirelessly back and forth between both sides at the West Hotel. To the employers, the governor said, Now see here, let's get this thing straight. There are parts of this National Industrial Recovery Act I don't like one bit better than you do. But this is the law of the land. And so long as I am governor of the state, I will uphold the law. Is that clear? And to the union leaders, the governor was equally firm. There is one thing I want from you, Miles, from you, Vince, and you, Farrell. There is one thing I want, and that is order. There is a new law in this country. It doesn't give you the right to take the law into your own hands. I'm the person charged with maintaining law and order in this state. And I'm going to have law and order whether you like it or not. Into this tension, the newly created machinery of the National Mediation Board intervened. The first federal mediators arrived, the Reverend Francis J. Haas and E.H. Dunnigan. On the 20th of July, more violence in the market area. Once again, the union had gone on strike. Once again, the employers armed themselves and with police assistance, 
tried to break through. Here they come, Papa! Look out, they got him! The toll there on the 20th day of July, 67 persons wounded, two of them fatally. Neither side would give away even then. And on July 26th, Governor Olson declared martial law and the National Guard took over Minneapolis. Armed soldiers enforced a system of trucking permits, maintaining the strike-bound condition of the city, but still permitting critically needed supplies to move in. The governor was criticized for this stand from both sides, but at last, peace seemed near. Then in the hot early days of August, mediators continued working with the two factions at the West Hotel. And so gradually in those hot days of August 1934, an agreement was finally worked out, not only in Minnesota, but all over the nation. The collective bargaining principle was at last established. Many other labor gains came later, the 40 hour week, paid vacations, time and a half for overtime, pension plans. Winning national attention was Minnesota's Labor Relations Act of 1939, a law that provides for strike notice, a cooling off period, for state mediation and conciliation, for arbitration of disputes, provided both sides agree. That law, patterned after the National Labor Relations Act, is considered a model which other states have adopted in their labor legislation. And even though men will continue to disagree, even though there may be strikes, management and labor, have learned indeed to respect one another's rights in this 20th century. It's getting on toward evening now in our state. The traffic jams are starting up all over again. The day's work is done. Everybody's in a hurry to get home. The shadows are getting a little longer each minute as the sun heads off toward the horizon. And back at Tom's house, supper's on, or it soon will be. There's the baby, you know, at her squally worst just before supper time, of course. Guess you mothers know all about that. Oh, say, here comes Tom now. Hi, honey. I'm home. Oh. Well, <laughs> say now, that was something. <sighs> Why? You look awfully happy tonight. Well, I guess I should be. Albright called me in today and told me it's all set. I get the new job. He did it. Now tell me, when will you start? Well, as a matter of fact, I already have. Started this morning. So quick? Mm -hmm. You know, Tom, I bet you wind up as president of the company someday. <laughs> now, now, wait a minute. Now, let, let's not get silly about this. I'm not being silly. Silly. Just mark my words. You just wait and see. Yep, and who knows? Someday he just might. You know, confounded, I've been around our state a long, long time. Longer than most of you, I guess. An awful lot's happened in my lifetime. Sure, the frontier is gone. Long gone. That is the frontier as it used to be. But there's a new frontier. I can't hold with those folks who say there isn't any opportunity anymore. Take Tom there. He might become president of the company and become president without having to say thanks, Dad, either. Seems to me we have a new frontier in this day and age. We have a frontier that's filled, chuck full of new electronics factories and super highways lined with stores and shops. Why, there's industries and new ideas and opportunities coming to our state we ain't even heard of yet. It's a cinch. By the year 2000, we'll have 10 million people in this state. And a hundred years from now, folks will have a whole new batch of success stories to tell. Like the one about Minnesota mining and Honeywell and our milling industry and about our banks and savings and loan associations. And that, the way I see it, is our new frontier, developing and expanding what we have, bringing in and starting out with something new, watching our chances, our opportunities, and taking them, not greedy, but smart-like. Doesn't make a bit of difference whether you're a working man, as I've been most of my life, or whether you're the highest muckety-muck of the lot, there is a future for you in our state. And Dad, blame it, I just wish I was going to be around the next hundred years myself. Yeah.